Tom. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you, Daniel? I'm doing fine, sir. It's really a delight to speak with you. I always enjoy the chance. So uh, I enjoyed the Forrest Landry piece on beauty and everything. That was that was really a delight. Um, and I, I mentioned to Tim the rabbit hole I went down with all of it. I, I just love that notion of beauty and attunement. So that that was quite uh, quite wonderful. Um, and uh, and I, I think that's just such an important topic with the Commons as well. How far did you go into his work? Like, did you get to the metaphysics itself? Yes, yes, yes. How do you square that up with some of the other minds that are being explored right now? Like, for example, Hegel is obviously very alive in these dialogues at the moment. Like, how do you see Forrest's modalities mapping onto some of these other systems? That's a great question. Um, increasingly, um, so what I like to say is you're seeing a massive movement of people realizing that presuppositional philosophy is problematic and we need intersuppositional philosophy. What Forrest is saying, you know, he has that part where he's like, okay, you have the observer and you have the object. And there's this question, is the observer primary? Is the object primary? It's like, well, the, well, well we can't say it's fundamental as a relation itself right? Like that very relation between, and let's examine that. And what does that mean? Well, that's intersuppositional. That's between, right? You see a big talk on Whitehead, Bergson, uh, event, process, you know, Bard, all, all the, you know, dialogos, you know, cipher, circling. Um, all of these things are intersuppositional because there's an awareness that it's impossible to have a ground, like a, a philosophical transcendent ground. But of course, this can lead to nihilism. This can lead to the death of philosophy and things like that. But you see, in a kind of Hegelian move, if you negate the possibility of a ground, that sublates into the possibility of something intersuppositional, where the foundation of philosophy becomes what can emerge between entities, um, a, a oneness from a multiplicity that is not possible otherwise. And I see a lot of what found Forrest Landry is speaking to is part of that conversation. There, it's kind of interesting. There's, a, and I would say Hegel is very intersuppositional. Um, he is absolutely asking the question in the science of logic. Um, how do we arrive at categories? Um, like, like in Kant, he assumes the categories of like space and time, right? And Hegel is like, where do those come from? Why do you assume those, right? You know, you haven't done the work of the thought that leads to the category because the thought assumes the category before you do it, right? Well, Hegel's going to talk about, say, consciousness and other, like becoming other. Well, that's an intersuppositional relationship. Like by inter, you know, I-N-T-E-R, I mean like between, right? Intersuppositional. So the formation of the subject in Hegel is intersuppositional. I'm obsessed with the Scottish Enlightenment and the Counter-Enlightenment. The, you know, for, for David Hume, morality is not a result of abstract categories by which you understand everything, but it is located in the common life, your relation with the average people and the sentiment that this arises to. He is not saying that morality does not exist. He's saying that presuppositional, objectively grounded morality doesn't exist, not because morality is relative, but because morality is intersuppositionally cultivated. And I would definitely say that Forrest Landry is um, operating within uh, that tradition. And also, when we're talking about such an imminent metaphysics, like a, philo a metaphysics that's very low, which it has a delusion notion to it, because, you know, he was all about kind of a transcendental emergentism. I don't think it's the same. Um, that, would, that would be another ball, ball field. Well, right there, it's a kind of notion that the, the ability to operate metaphysically is not found by a kind of a system that you impose or a ground that you push up, but it is found by precisely the imminent relationship in which phenomenon in lo is located. So what I find fascinating is I don't want to say like a collective consciousness in a kind of spooky way, but you're seeing across all, all of these kind of internet spaces an emergence of philosophy and practices that are addressing nihilism, the meaning crisis, et cetera, intersuppositionally. Now, maybe it's a medium is the message thing where the internet is intersuppositional and being a network effect and connecting and that very medium has a way of lending itself in an intersuppositional direction but um i don't think it's merely arbitrary because indeed uh one of the advantages of um, going through modernity and post-modernity and all the mistakes of it is precisely seeing the problem of totalizing transcendent grounded projects that can lead to totalitarianism but then the problem of a post-modernity that rejects the possibility of that either and then you just get the nihilism and cynicism so i actually see what forrest landry now i'm not saying all the philosophies are the same or equivalent because there's all the details that have to be gone through but i see him um as what i understand as really in that conversation i i feel like all the major philosophical conversations right now are very intersuppositional um they they're really intersuppositional not pre 
suppositional and they really want to, and really they're trying to save philosophy because if you like if you look in america philosophy basically became richard Rohr, like neo-pragmatism right it became like a form of you know what does richard Rohr say that capital t truth needs to go on vacation no need to worry about it anymore the problem is once capital t truth goes on vacation all you have is power and then you get popularism fascism control you have no way to stop it because the power of a well-done philosophy is it actually can contain power by saying oh you're telling me what is good no 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 no. this is the good and you need to sit down mr totalitarian dictator well once you throw out the capital t truth that is more difficult to do and i think there's a, a realization of this so there's a movement in an intersuppositional direction as i call it. that's a word i use I, i've heard you use that term and i really like it that mm. coupled obviously with the a b logic sure i think that Hearing feels like, and then this issue of libido and motivation, which I was sort of trying to bring in before. But what I what I see as problematic is seems like there's an interpositional field forming in the digital, but it it has a sort of it's almost like the the nature of the physical. Like the speed that it operates at is almost going to make it like incompatible with the sorts of attunements that are occurring in the digital space because, because intersupposition requires a contact and like a continuity of contact, right? Because it's transformative because it's AB. There's something about it not being able to translate beyond the membranes that it's functioning inside of and therefore might the intersuppositions actually end up factoring the digital substrate into their normativity and then be incompatible with the physical, which, the, and what I'm thinking is like, maybe this isn't a problem. Maybe physical community is in a way dead, at least an aspect of it, as long as we don't collapse ecologically, which there's probably actually a really high chance that we do, in which case not having intersupposition in the physical is going to become extremely problematic but if we took it just for a moment that we were actually going to be okay we we're going to thread the needle and like probably robots end up doing a lot of our kind of infrastructural uh ecological basic human needs could, could you see a world where the sort of psyche actually ends up residing more in the digital than in the physical and I, I know there's something very like dystopian about that but and it almost feels like maybe if we don't actually proactively push against that then that's exactly what's going to happen but maybe just first like the, the main thought i'd like you to like address is this if if the attunement which is very much an intimacy process is happening in a certain substrate what like do you feel like that will be compatible with the kinds of intersuppositions that might arise in a physical and and maybe this factors in the hermeneutics of space versus time in a sense as well sure. because the digital is much more time-based as well go for that's it that, that, that's a magnificent that was magnificent um a few things so the problem with speed is very real paul really was very good at that and when you have a disconnect of speed then the very, very fact like with a digital could accelerate in an intersuppositional way very very quickly uh and the people who could do that would be more exclusive and then almost in becoming experts at that lose the ability to bring it to the analog or to connect with the analog in the same way like a very good example of this is if you get like a PhD world specialist in Chaffer, like uh, the Canterbury Tales or different things, that person struggles to tell people what they do for work because it is so specialized in English literature, right? So specialization brings with it a kind of imperceptibility, if I use a Deleuzean term, which can create a disconnect, which then can incentivize academics to do what? Stay in the ivory tower, never go out into the real world, and then that we create all the social problematic dynamics that we have now, right? Where the ivory tower is not connected with the real world the will but the, the quote-unquote real world but then the real world resents the ivory tower and now you have all these class dynamics it's almost like you have an education dynamic now um or certification dynamic and certainly it is very possible unfortunately that a similar dynamic like that could occur where online becomes a kind of ivory tower if you will maybe a digital tower and that actually creates almost gated community you know one of the things you 
people worry about in dystopias is the rich have a gated community and everyone's out on the outside. You could have a kind of gated community, if you will, that could happen of the digital, the analog, uh, the eye and all the different things like that, which could be a kind of kind of, um, you know, there's like you talk about like class warfare. It's, I, I almost want to say ont ontological warfare because of mm -hmm. the different ways of being that people will operate with, because I definitely think the digital has an ontological implication. It is very, very deep, like like people who can read. I, I don't want to take it too far. I'd have to think about it. But like people who weren't before the printing press, like people had almost a different ontology than people after the printing press. And then after the phone and after like economic, money, like it's things like that occur. So there's definitely a risk of a kind of um, ontological warfare, kind of class warfare that can occur. And this makes me think of a little bit of Daniel Frager's work on, on ontological design and different things. Um, I think it's very on the question also of like real communities like going away. Um, indeed, that's been occurring from like Robert Putman, bowling alone, people don't, you know, it used to be like my grandmother was in a bowling club on Friday nights, people don't do it anymore, you don't have Lions Club, Boy Scouts have been collapsing, you know, uh, Neil Postman and P Putman blame the television, you know, people watching TV kind of destroy the communal capital, social capital, and it's increasingly gone online and different things. So the question is the following, uh, do, if all community went online, and consciousness was primarily online, would something be lost in community and in consciousness that's like irreconcilable, like it's, it's like a it's like a total loss, like it's something really, really bad that is lost um, in a real way? Well, I think what will be lost really is probably the very necessary encounter with inconvenience, the real difficulty, suffering, pain, orphans, and the poor. That forces you to find out if you're a self-enclosed subject or if you're actually open to the other. Because one of the reasons why online communities are so wonderful is precisely because they can self-select for people that are relatively similar. And one of the reasons why they're so dangerous is because they can self-select for people that are relatively similar. No different than college. Why is college so different? Because it's a kind of Bouldriard hyper-reality. You're around a bunch of people of a similar intellectual level who are rather interesting. They're very interesting. They're easy to get along with and you never want to leave. Like people for the, their entire life will say college was the best years of my life. You know, older generations will say that, oh, I'd like to go back. There is a danger of that occurring in online communities where people are like, oh, these, these are better than the real things. Um, there are possibly very big dangers with that in that it can silo people increasingly to not force themselves as subjects to expand themselves, to encounter difference and to really incorporate difference, which then of course will probably lead to self-deception or um, closed-minded where you're not um, black swans, like you're enclosed in your thinking, your reality tunnel, I think is a term I've heard. Um, you know, you're enclosed in your reality tunnel. And if that's the case, well, here's the problem. It would probably be difficult to be truly AB Right. If you're stuck in an, in a reality tunnel, you're actually very AA because you have similar logic. And also from that, if we're saying that somehow deepest reality is intersuppositional, well, it's going to be difficult to have real intersuppositions. It's going to be difficult to have real intersuppositional activity with otherness. It's just going to occur within reality tunnels, which means it will be mm -hmm. impoverished. It will be impoverished. You're actually going to lose the intersuppositional. And then, of course, this will be terrible because you'll still have the shadow of Buddha, per se. You'll still have the shadow of the intersuppositional, and it won't be there in the same way. It, it will lose its texture. It will become a kind of flat ontology, if you will. It will lose its dynamicism. But then, of course, it, the problem could be that at that point, you've lost all of the resource analog or outside of that reality tunnel to go to if the reality tunnel fails. And then at that point, it's a kind of total depravity, like you've lost alternatives because you didn't think you'd need those alternatives anymore until you did. And now you don't. And that can be a real problem. Also, I think um, we always must never, ever forget that we are able to use the internet because someone has built towers and infrastructure to make these things possible. And we are standing on their shoulders. Maybe they've never read our ability to say, talk about Paul Virilio or intersuppositional is thanks to someone who may have never heard of those names ever before. And we're completely indebted to that person. And that person is indebted to the restaurant they can eat at on the way and the person who made the car that they can drive. An economy is a profound chain of dependency of everyone upon everyone else. It's actually so profound, we always lose sight of it. Like right mm. now, I know that if I would have suddenly like have a heart attack, I could go to a hospital. And as a result, 
That kind of creates an existential security, knowing that at hand, there are people that can actually help solve my problems if they arise, right? It's not explicit, but it operates on a, on a, um, impl like a an implicit in the background level, right? And that actually provides the ability to say, have the stability or to focus on these communities online because I can know that I can do that. If you don't have any real world communities, relationships or analog because everything is online, well, then there's a lot of people of whom are going to be going through very deep mental existential depression who then will say, what's the point of fixing internet towers? What's the point of being a doctor? There is an unbelievable crisis brewing right now where everyone's quitting healthcare. It's very pronounced mm. in the UK. It's going to spread around the world. And I don't think people understand what will happen if you don't have healthcare workers. Okay. Right. And why should they be healthcare workers? They're treated like crap. They're not paid enough. They know friends who just went into a startup who work a whole lot less and make a whole lot more and they don't feel respected okay well guess what we're going to be we're going to be in trouble and what could occur is if there's not enough of an emphasis on analog community then people won't create those things which means they won't have the social support to actually help them do these works that make society happen that if are not occurring you can't even have the online community mm -hmm. now you can argue and say that ai and robots are going to do all that well i'll believe it when i see it i'd like to you know it's you know it's kind of like do, it's almost like do sex machina now where AI and robots are going to do everything so we don't have to worry about these problems. You know, they'll fix the, the Wi-Fi towers. Yeah, let me tell you something. It's really easier to make an AI that can say stock pick or diagnose a patient. You you show me a robot that can climb and build one of those towers over there to make the Wi-Fi possible. Oh, That's yeah. probably 100 the years old. sensory off. motor is a real problem. <laughs> It's unbelievable. Like what people don't understand is it's easier to create an algorithm to stock pick than to clean a bookshelf. Like it's not occurred to people yet that actually the bookshelf problem is more severe than the stock picking. They do this thing where they say, well, if algorithms can stock pick and like do law do clerks for lawyers and diagnose, but in their head, they're like, well, we're there. No, no. All of the physical labor is actually a higher problem that's way down the line for the coordination. And so we're kind of making plans on how we do society for realities that are maybe like 50 to 100 years off, which then may result in us not getting to those futures because we destroyed our society and economy before we could get there. Kind of a Keynesian problem in a way. Um, so to your, to your question, I think like it's going to actually be very important as the digital, as consciousness indeed gains incredible benefits from the digital and is able to interact intersuppositionally with people to unlock potential in it that otherwise it didn't know, that this doesn't become almost a Garden of Eden temptation where you forget about the outside world and actually you always bring it back to the outside world to enhance it and to keep it alive. Because literally it is not possible to have a digital world without an analog world. It's not possible because the infrastructure of the digital is in the analog entirely and your your body will like decay right and kind of go away and also if it's true that the whole body is actually the brain you'll hear this where the whole body is an information gathering unit yeah. well then it could be possible that in a pure di digital the collective consciousness quote unquote only has one way of knowing of abstract knowledge which actually could make us prone to radical mistake error and cause all sorts of problems in different things so i actually think there's going to be a kind of temptation almost to do this um i mm -hmm. do think we I do think we we do have to kind of not do a thing where we go digital communities aren't real. Like that's going to be something like there's a ditch there, right? And analog communities are more real in a way. Well, they're different. They're different. Like they have a place at the table if we as subjects can learn to keep them balanced and together and not conflicting one another, to not stack them in a hierarchy. The digital can absolutely enhance the analog, but the analog can add a, a texture to the digital. And figuring out how to do both of those things, I think is going to be very, um, very important. I, I do think, well, let me put it this way, like on this idea of consciousness becoming completely digital, arguably, we actually kind of see societies that are doing this. Korea, Japan, a lot of Eastern nations. And boy, howdy, is their quality of life pretty low. Uh, there's mm. high suicide rates, high depression rates. Um, young men are not getting married. No one is having babies. And you see, to me too, I guess very often in this conversation, I always kind of come back to babies. I really do. Because the reality of, say, children right there uh, requires an analog world.
of people that you can like take them outside, um, that can help you. You can take them places. You can raise them. You know, the digital will never raise children unless I guess we are straight up in the matrix at that point. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's going to be an analog world. And it, when the digital goes online completely and that I really do, like, basically, there is a super high number of um, eight, you know, East, um, East Asians that practically are always online, that are for an incredibly large amount of time. There's a term in Japan for people who never leave their apartment. It's a hakamori. There's a term. What is the term? Yeah. Is it like ho hokekomori it's or something? Yeah, there's yeah. a term for it. And it's and it's actually so prevalent as a problem that the prime minister of health has actually started launching investigations of it. This is thousands of people. Thousands of people. This is not a small, this is an incredible issue. And of course, the birth yeah. rates are gone. Um, you know, the older people, I think they sell more diapers to 80 year olds than babies. It's remarkable. I do think that that's basically what occurs when you try to totally replace the analog with the digital. I think that's what occurs. And it also occurs if you try to make your identity entirely your work. That's the other part of the equation where in Japan, they have a very, very traditionalist work culture and different things. And for some weird reason, like um, the internet brings with it like endless work hours. You would think it'd be the reverse because you'd like be more of it, but no, it's like hyper, right? It's like endless work now with white yeah, collar people. So, those, so, and the digital brings that because it's almost like the pure digital then almost becomes pure productivity. Like that, that's a danger of it as well. Like you should always be listening to a podcast. You should always be learning something. You should always be doing these things where then you never learn the attunements of being human. You're just downloading info. So you almost become a computer. Like you're downloading info and you're always productive in the system. This kind of hyper, I've heard this term, hyper modernism, I guess is what they call it. Like you see this in Japan. So to me, um, and then I could get into Deleuze because I think like there's something about Deleuze in this equation, but now I'm being, but I'm being very vague. So I'm going to skip all that. Let me um, add something in and then this. let's go Please. to Deleuze afterwards. Yes. It feels like something of immense value would be to actually really think through and explicate the value of the analog as a sort of doctrine for the people who are really getting in touch with the digital in this really powerful transformative way and i, I would i would love to see some people in this space do that because this is what I, this is sort of what i was trying to articulate before with tim this is a real problem for me and i, I think some of it stems because i am young and i am single i think it's much easier for me to be taken up all of my social interactions are purely, uh, they're a choice. They're, they're recreational. And I, I happen to be like introverted enough that I can go for extended periods and not see people. And actually, as long as I'm looking after my physical health, I can sustain like a decent well-being. And that being said, I, I am a social person. Like I love my relationships. So that's not, sure. it's not a problem for me, but it is, I think beyond purely recreational sort of and like this appreciating people's being like that aspect of friendship my efforts towards community are like continually being called into question by my own mind because there's so much tension there and like you said contrasted to this sort of uh i think one thing is the self-selection of the internet but i also think the other thing is the ironically the spaciousness of it it creates a, a level of space between people where you can fully enjoy their like intellect and aspects of their soul if you'll allow me that term without falling into the libidinal tensions and the shadow projections and so it's almost it, it's it's hyper real in a sense and i think there's something really powerful about that that we can utilize to build out certain things like superstructure like developing this new logic like all these kind of things at the level of information we can actually do far more effectively because we have that space and we don't yes. get so many of these like yes. libidinal tensions bound up in it but as you say we need the analog and to me like what what we're really saying is we need a form of analog that will force us into an encounter with those libidinal forces because the level of intimacy necessary for things like child raising and all of these things that 
the substrate of the internet is dependent upon are going to require us to go into that level of contact with people. Cause there is like, I can see. And when I say like, you can imagine community just sort of dying out. I know community has been dying for a long time, but we definitely still like see a value in relationships. But for me, the distinction between sort of like friendship and relationship and community is to me, community undergoes a certain kind of work that causes like interrelation of motivations in a way that's incredibly hard to be in for sustained periods and to have like a continuity with. Yes. And it's sort of like when we were in that actual community, the first reason we were doing that is because if you didn't, you would die. That was, that was the tribalism. And then the second reason was there was such a strong normativity around collectivism that if you didn't do the like social thing, you were essentially dead. You're at least going to be like psycho spiritually dead because you are, you know, a heretic or something like that. And now it seems like we're in this very first time where community that undergoes work and maybe maintains a commons as Forrest was pointing to, that's in a, it's seen, it appears as purely optional. We're, we're sort of saying here it's definitely not optional, but at least at this moment in time, there's a pure optionality at the level of the immediacy of it. And that for me is like, that's the deepest tension inside of me right now is every day I face these tensions. I'm being a bit dramatic here, but every day I face these tensions with my community. And then there's this voice that's like, you don't need this. Like nothing about this is required and even maybe for like a decent time scale, but as, as you were sort of pointing to, and as I'm sort of proposing now, like maybe this very thing really needs to be explicated in a way where we can actually build this into our narrative around this space online. It's like, here's why we're also doing analog. Here's the problems of it. Here's the like reality that needs to be established it, it needs to go beyond just friendship and into this actual like doing work as community establishing commons and here's why and then sort of being able to like hold ourselves to that as a normative standard magnificent um i do so a few things um it almost does seem as if you need something like an apostle's creed <laughs> you know like a creed like you'd see in religions where like they all get together and they go okay all right we're about to kill each other so can we just like what is the most basic fundamental thing we can agree on that if you're a christian you believe like and if you don't believe it you're not a christian like okay all the other stuff is debate we're not sure about it but what is the most fundamental right and they could and they say well you know the god the father in heaven holy Spirit, etc they do the creed then they have the anata creed then they have the nicene creed and all these different things and the reason is that without that it was chaos and no one had any idea what constituted a Gnostic from a Christian and so on and so forth. So one of the main reasons they do this, or even they go through the process with like Athanasius determining what books should be in the gospel, the canon, and what should not relative to a consistent theology. That's a whole nother topic. But it's almost like what you have now is without a, 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 a clear guide. We'll use that language versus creed. Without a clear guide, it's very difficult actually not to be a kind of digital Gnostic where reality is spirit or the digital and you can't, and the body is kind of bad and dirty and we really don't know what to do with that. Uh, so it's kind of Gnosticism actually in a funny way. Well, if you go back on the history and I'm just using Christianity as an example, so much of the formation of clear doctrine, clear canon, you know, clear book, was to stop Gnosticism. Now, you can argue they went too far or they didn't do it right or whatever, but I think the impulse was quite good. The impulse is like, hey, there has to be like a clear standard of what you do or you're in trouble. So likewise, it's almost like you need a clear guide of this is what the digital is for. This is when you're taking it too far. This is how you relate it to the analog, right? And to actually have that kind of guide or otherwise you're just kind of feeling it out. It's completely random. And what the early church basically understood is that if people are left to feel things out for themselves, they end up in Gnosticism. Like it's almost like impossible for them not to end up in Gnosticism if they're feeling things out for themselves, right? And that's kind of what's happening with the digital. It's not clear, so people go to the digital because YouTube is awesome. And, you know, the communities are awesome. Like, it just pulls you, especially when you have the phone, right? And you can do it. So, you know, that occurs. Um, so to me, like, for example, you mentioned the lib libidinal. So an advantage of the online is precisely that you can encounter people outside the libidinal. Um, and that, therefore, you can kind of meet them in different terms. 
Well, you know, one of the questions is going to be the ability to not say, take the libidinal, like the ability to avoid the libidinal online as escapist, but instead to go online and say, hey, wow, it turns out that people can be pretty awesome. So maybe when I'm encountering the libidinal in the analog, I shouldn't be so quick to like never talk to the person again, because you received a kind of revelation of how people can be online that then you carry and remember in the analog, right? So that's always kind of a relation between um, mysticism and religion too, where religion is like, hey, you have a mystical experience to take to the religion to empower it that you don't forget, but you actually can't get rid of the religion for pure mysticism because then it's chaos no one wants to do anything in the community they just want to have mystical experience can you blame them uh you would say mm -hmm. no so you always had to almost basically force people out of mysticism into religion so that they would communally operate otherwise there'd be no community in which could be in which people could have mystical experiences right or which they could apathetically relate to god so there's actually in a funny way to me some similar tensions that are happening with mm. the analog and the digital, which kind of makes sense, right? Because like spiritual, real, digital, analog, you know, there's some kind of overlays. And indeed, I do think some of the problems and tensions you've seen in the formations of religion or the church might provide a guide uh, for how to go about um, doing the digital. So, for example... One of the big things that religion saw they had to emphasize was somehow to discuss sexuality in a manner that did not demonize it, but also did not let it be unleashed for everyone to have sex because then there'd be orphans everywhere and to somehow make the family like a holy unit, right? Because raising ch children is difficult. Family can be hard because there's so much of those libidinal features that are going on, right? So religions became very, very concerned about sexuality and thinking about sexuality and how to go about sexuality. Well, sexuality is a prime example of where people are utterly confused online in the digital, right? They don't, you have total exposure to pornography, sex, and then sex possibilities, polyamory, all these different things. It is a wild west, right? Well, religions were like, hey, if we don't talk about sex, it's a wild west. People have no idea what's going on. And basically you can't have society because society is only possible if you have some sort of bracketing in on sexual possibility. Now, of course, you can say that's unjust or that demonizes and it limits. Well, though, yes, and, but that's always the tension that you're operating with, right? Um, so yeah, I think like, so for example, like you basically almost need like a list that says one, use the internet to encounter people outside of libidinal tensions so that you can then in the analog, remember that people are actually able to relate beyond the libidinal and hold to that memory so that you don't get like angry and discouraged as soon as you have an encounter with the lib libidinal and run off online, right? You know, like, so, like different things like that that you almost have to go through, right? And, um, you know, number two, don't use sexual possibility online to replace intimacy between people because that can be a tension that happens. And certainly there's a lot of research that shows intimacy requires full body, not just the brain, because the whole body is actually a kind of brain. And in order to get that sort of connection, it seems like it has to be full body, right? And you can't replace that with just a mere um, sexual high of some kind or like a pornographic, different things like that. Now the questions of these different sexual, that's entirely different, but you're starting to say, oh, this is what the digital for is for. This is what the analog is for. This is how I use the digital to enhance the analog. And if I enhance the analog, well, then people will be better to come to the digital. They'll have a different way that they carry themselves on the digital and these things can inform one another. But I, I definitely think like, I mean, what you're saying really resonates because like precisely because the digital is so powerful, it precisely because it does have so much going on, you need clear guides, right? Like precisely because like if you're talking like religion, precisely because God can do anything, oh, well, then any religious doctrine can explode and you get Gnosticism and all the different interpretations because God, no one knows for sure, right? And there's an infinite possibility that then automatically creates a limitlessness that makes it difficult to cohere for anyone to know what to do. So the, the, the point that you're bringing up actually kind of makes me think of the formation of Apostles' Creeds, the Ionic Creed, and kind of the formation of those different things. Because because what because what else? You, then how do you figure it out? Like Like, why wouldn't you be a dualist? Like, why wouldn't you be a Gnostic? The digital is awesome. Like, why wouldn't you? And like Christianity, and I just bring Christianity up because it comes to mind. The reason it comes to mind because Christianity so emphasizes incarnational 
metaphysics where you can't separate spirit and body like spirit and body are two sides of the same coin and there's always an incarnational relationship right well if we're talking about like digital and analog relating there's some sort of incarnational logic in operation mm -hmm. where the digital is going to be informing the analog and the analog is going to be informing the digital and basically the great curse the great war of Christianity has always been against forms of dualism, Gnosticism, either or ism. And there have been hundreds of years where it lost that war and fell into um, dualism, Cartesianism, and different. And then there were periods where it came out of it. Then it fell right back into it and came out of it. And so much of the formation of it has been trying to keep them in a mutually enhancing relationship as opposed to an either or. And I think basically that's what's going to happen with the analog and, and the digital is like guides to have them mutually informing as opposed to basically the digital replacing the analog. Yeah, well, really well said. And I, I think what's terrifying about the digital, you could argue that even the Gnostics had a sort of allure to them and they were able to construct certain narratives that would capture people's attention. But the well, kind of attention hijack. Right? Yeah. 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 The, the, the kind of attentional hijack that takes place in the, like, I guess you could call it in the mechanistic, like the way in which they're actually able to systematically optimize for that capture. It sort mm. of feels like a different order of magnitude of intensity that we have to push back against for this like Gnostic allure. And I, I think like, if, if I'm being honest, the only thing that I've really seen reliably pull people out of that whole machine. And it, the, the thing is the machine itself isn't just digital. It primarily is now, but a lot of it is sort of, uh, like basic modernity with things like consumerism and sort of all of the individualism that is pushing people into this sort of self self focus. But it seems like the thing that reliably gets people out of that whole mechanism is actually an encounter with some sort of tragedy, even if it's their own tragedy being like a mental health thing. And so and maybe you get like the the sort of rare individual who goes off on a quest to like you know discover and maybe they make it through all of these sort of traps and perils and get to the illumination beyond it but i think for your average person unless they've had the sufficient like tragedy they will and th this is interesting because this ties back into the attunement to beauty and like maybe there's a question there around like is beauty as compelling as the like negativity of tragedy and obviously those two things are often like inextricably linked beauty and tragedy but it sort of feels like the dopaminergic intensity of the attentional capture of these machines it's almost like it completely cripples beauty but it can't cripple like the depths of mental illness uh, that th th this is sort of I i'm speculating here but it kind of and like, yeah, if someone takes some psychedelics and they, you know, get blasted by God, then it's like, yeah, sure, that's going to pull them out of it. But I think for your average person in the mundane, it's much harder to like sensitize yourself to beauty when you're being drowned in these sort of neurotransmitter cocktails than it is to actually just bottom out into a sort of either like nihilistic depression or some sort of like crippling anxiety to the point where you actually have to step away and walk outside. And then at that moment, the sunlight hits your face and you kind of. You put that so well. Um, again, another, like, speaking theologically, like, throughout religions, and again, I'll just speak from Christianity, it's easier to speak from a single tradition as opposed to many. There's always been this weird thing where it's basically either beauty or devastation that wakes you up. A beautific vision or a cross. And then, of course, they mix because the cross leads to the beauty and the beauty is the cross and so on and so forth. But Again, they're like, if the analog does not have a compelling beauty to pull, to attract you into it, then you're going to stay in the digital. Like, this is where beauty is going to be a very, very big deal. And I don't actually think it's by chance that, say, when Christianity in America went through some of its more problematic phases, there was an emphasis, like, it's where it stopped really emphasizing art and beauty. Like, if you're in a medieval town and you had the freaking cathedral, would there be any doubt that this is a spaceship to another realm, right? I mean, you'd, make, you'd walk in and hear music you never heard before. It would completely scream to you of an alternative dimension. 
Well, when you got into American Protestantism and there's much less of an emphasis on beauty, then there's a whole lot of emphasis on guilt, sin, fallenness, penal substitution, because that's how you make up for it. And of course, that can lead to some trouble, right? Um, so there's definitely, even if there's truth to kind of notions of guilt, because there is right and wrong and there are bad things to do, but when it's out of balance with beauty, then it becomes purely um, punitive. And then it, you get some, you can, you can have some trouble that can come from that. Um, so definitely for me, like one of the, if we were talking about the creed of the internet, like I always, I, I really like, I, I don't like, if I'm choosing between a podcast from like a very practical example, and there's like a podcast about um, something that happened in World War One or something. Now, I'm fascinated by the World Wars. I find them remarkable. I would sit and talk with my granddad all the time about it. Um, but I'm not right now relating. I don't know a single person who, say, is incredibly interested in World War One. So learning about that is not going to help me relate to that person. Two, I'm not working on anything that results in, you know, that deals with World War One. So there's no reason to do that. Um, and it would also just kind of be information and facts, right, that I could put in my head, but, but what would it do, right? So I'm not going to listen to that podcast. Um, however, I listen to Forrest Landry because that indeed would impact possibly how you interact analog, right? In an analog world with real people and looking in terms of formulating a comments that is grounded in beauty. I'm also going to listen to that because that has obviously an impact on the digital, right? So I think like for me, I've always found it really, really important to have a heuristic to determine content in the context of enhancing the analog in terms of beauty and wonder or enhancing relationships. Like I basically mm -hmm. don't like, for example, um, I don't listen to stuff like Lex Friedman or whatever, not because I dislike him, but because I have a limited amount of time and I rather listen to the content that my friends are making like Javier, Davoud, Kate, you know, Cadell or different things because I have a relation there. They're creating something and I want to know what they're doing. And also if I know what they're doing, I can relate to them better. And actually I've frankly come to the point where I found that that tends to be the best content because those people are bringing together threads and they've actually thought of a lot of things. So I guess for me, one of the ways that helps with this is I kind of have a, I don't want to say a creed, I guess you could call it a creed, but a kind of heuristic where you're avoiding just infinite information uh, in favor of information that is actually in form of relationships or, in, or informing relationships and helping you relate to the analog world, like the real world um to see things as more beautiful to not right, like if you're if you're learning online how to not end up in like self-deception and conflicts that's good for real relationships and relationships with people right so like i guess i find that that really helps when i think about the digital not as oh my gosh i gotta listen to all of lex friedman or all of the theories of everything channel although that's an impressive channel that guy's great um you know i find that guy notably informative um but i don't prioritize that I don't prioritize it at all and it's not a big deal because it's not in the bounds of the relationships i'm forming so and i'm not saying that that always has to be what you do i'm not saying you can never watch a netflix show or something like that but that at least i guess for me helps kind of determine what to watch what to listen to what not i'm actually convinced that like infinitely listening to podcasts is a kind of fake intellectualism. Now, I'm not just saying that because I don't do it, but you're just filling your head and you're not even processing it or you don't bring it into anything. There's almost, I'm just talking, you know, Justin was mentioning Mr. Murphy and it's like, there's a kind of like, it's a new problem actually that uh, that, that's formulating that one has to watch out for in different ways uh, because, because it's infinite and it doesn't really do anything for you. So I do wonder like, and the reason I make this example is because arguably a tenet of Christianity is like, hey, you can only engage in the work of the Holy Spirit in mysticism if you can integrate it into religion, if you can integrate it in, into practices. If you can't bring it back into real lived experiences, that's your own private thing. And I'm not saying it didn't happen, but that's your thing. And you can't like it's you have to almost like Wittgenstein, keep it quiet basically, right? Uh, like that's your thing, but if it can't be integrated into the community, then it has to stay your thing or otherwise it might actually destroy the religion. Uh, and mm -hmm. because you're, because then each individual person has their own mystical experience and they're speaking on behalf of God and that breaks everything down, right? And so, you know, those tensions between like, you know, I think in Catholicism, one of the catechisms is like the point of Catholicism is everyone becomes a mystic. Well, that's pretty radical. Uh, and yet, if you think like God spoke to you mystically, you always have to go check it with the priest. 
you can't just straight up tell people that's like a problem. You have to run it through the priest because you have to maintain the mechanisms of the religion. Well, likewise, you have the mechanisms of where the digital it's, it's like a thing now to make sure that the digital does not come to replace the analog, that it always has to be filtered through analog tests or test of relation or feeding relation or otherwise it's going to consume everything. It's just going to eat everything. Uh, and and it just like Gnosticism, just like a pure mysticism. I mean, one of the things, like, funny enough, one of the things that killed community in America was the spiritual, not religious movement. In a way, that's great. In a way, there's a great positive to it. But if it ultimately doesn't have to be integrated, it kind of frees everyone from dogmas, frees everyone into possibility. And then they just keep flying off. Uh, they never come back together. There's a good in it, but there's a danger in it. And so... I think all of that actually is mapping on to the analog digital problem. Uh, and, 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 if we, and then the question is, okay, what did the religions do to deal with these tensions? Then those are things that the, that the digital analog will need to do. You know, the, the only thing I would say, like when people are like, oh, we're just going to go pure digital. We don't have to worry about the analog. It just reminds me of so many Christians that are like, we'll just get, you know, we'll just go to heaven. We just have to worry about the spiritual. We don't have to worry about the earthly. And that was such a terrible pitfall in every religion. And I just... I can't prove it because I don't know the future. It just seems like a repetition with that when there's too much emphasis on everything's going digital, everything's going to be, you know, roboticized and AI, everything's going to be the singularity. It's like, well, obviously there's going to be increasing technological expedition. I've read Kurzweil, I understand this, but it just, it just really is similar to that kind of escapist theology that created so much mental health issues, so many neuroses, so many different problems. So yeah, no, I, I think I've heard the phrase fully automated luxury Gnosticism thrown out there. And I just thought that was, yeah, like a, a very good, good term. That's Not hilarious. Mine. I think it was in a rebel wisdom conversation, but yeah, that very, so very much with you on that. Um, I want to go back and then I'll come yeah. back to some of these other points. Ah, yeah. So one of the real tensions that I've seen in my own community is there's beauty there and it's very explicit that like, wow, this is beautiful, but there's actually this real tension around, well, firstly economics, but economics and like work and family life. And yep. what, what I've noticed is the, the principles that have come from the digital into our community, because our community has been derived from, the liminal normative sphere it, a lot of the people in there don't really know that because they don't have like a philosophical interest but yeah. the sort of the a lot of the language and the like the sort of meta modern sensibility this attempt to do the a b thing it's all come from there but that sort of sensibility isn't yet compatible with at least in my country and my culture with family life or work life it, it's there's no you as you said you can sort of reconcile it by using that to show up to those things in different ways but for a lot of these people the transformation into that normativity hasn't like fully solidified and you could argue it never would fully solidify but they'd be taken up by it to the point where it was intuitive and organically a part of them but there's one, there's a tension there where I don't even know, like, and this is coming from my own perspective, I don't even know if I want them to take that up fully because of how challenging that then becomes when trying to participate in the, like, everydayness of family and work. And that's not for me to decide, of course, but I do kind of have this, I, I see it in them where we participate in this beauty and this beauty is not entirely woven. It's not obvious how it weaves into the mundane. It definitely does. And it, it would be false to say that those are distinct worlds. I think that would be another form of Gnosticism where you're like escaping out of the mundane into the like beauty of some other like sure, community. Um, but there's definitely like a, there's a non-trivial challenge there and so often the like continuity of our community gets disturbed because of the necessity of family and work and mainly work like family's pretty like uh backgrounded for most people my age in, in this culture that i'm living in but it's sort of like 
they they need to come together but the like the ability to bring those two things together as we're just saying right now is incredibly difficult so it's almost like now you don't just have like digital analog you also have analog informed by digital in tension with analog that's sort of purely being informed by capitalism because it like this the analog i'm speaking to like yeah it has flavors of like christianity and whatnot but it's mainly just this like sort of absurd digital pluralism culture that is grounded in some sort of like capitalist industrialist engine it, it, it's absurd is the perfect word for a lot of these kinds of things it's like i just oh, yeah. end up throwing my hands up it's like good luck dealing with that you know <laughs> oh that's hilarious well i've heard the term i don't know how i feel they call it hyper realism this kind of weird analog mixture of like digital but hyper capitalism competitive it's this weird kind of um i guess the lose would want to call it like schizophrenic kind of a uh, form of socio-economic political structure yeah. and it, and it kind of has that character absolutely it does um everything you said is really important and it's actually one of the reasons why um it's very silly i well that that's that's hard um but you must keep an analog space because like like going back to the religious example basically it was like understood that very large percentages of the congregation did not want mystical experiences and actually mystical experiences would be bad for them because it would destabilize their understanding of the Bible or religion or what God could do. And it would lead to such existential anxiety for them that they would never recover. Whereas there was another amount of people that could be exposed to the more mystical or wild side who would be able to integrate it you know i know bard will talk about the shaman we could talk Tan about tantric coral, and you know, sutric yeah yeah all these different or coral and until you know this kind of different things now extremely important if you don't have the part of the congregation that doesn't like the mystical then the church falls apart and you're not able to take care of the orphans because they're not able to kind of go but if you have no mystical dimension of the church the church dies because it actually derives its authority from mystical possibility you know the reason why this church has authority on how you live your life is because it connects with god somehow how exactly that's in a different ball but the mystical is a kind of stamp boom that there's reason to believe that there's a connection here so if you don't have any mystical at all the church dies because it loses its authority actually um and you can say but it doesn't it derive its authority say from the bible well protestants tried that and everyone left the church you know it, it works for a little bit until it feels totalitarian and lacks truth and basically it almost always inevitably must lack truth because the model underfits it's outdated like as things advance it's not no it, the bible does not specifically speak of the internet or nuclear bombs or drones if you don't have a kind of mystical dimension or a holy spirit inspiring you to inform you of new possibilities of how to think of the christian framework within drone warfare then you end up just kind of hammering something and then that kills it right so you have to have both you have to have both but you had to but the majority of the religion was actually for people that didn't want anything to do with the mystical directly right and so frankly the online communities that are going into these deep spaces will probably always be a minority of people and actually bringing people into them of whom do not have the personality for it god bless them because they're why you can get your car fixed um you know then you're going to be in massive massive trouble also those people can bring texture and reality to your life that you will struggle to bring to your life and uh, make you face those kind of concrete realities that if you don't face you're a flat person you're not dynamic if all you have is the digital it feels like it because there's lots of colors and explosions and different things but if all you have is the digital you're actually a flat ontology um so you should not assume that you're dynamic just because you like the internet uh that doesn't necessarily follow um so indeed another reason why i believe over emphasizing the fact that all of society will be digital and everything will be online digital that's like where they said everything like religion will be replaced by mysticism religion will be replaced by spirituality that did not work at all that was a disaster um that was the meaning that's like just that's been a complete utter freaking disaster um and so likewise all of this thinking about everything going online and we don't have to care about the analog um that's a problem that's a massive problem now there will be things where say some people of certain personality types will will kind of really want to separate their online for the work life they'll say oh i just want to have my community online and my work is entirely analog and my family is more analog and we don't do a lot online people will customize relative to their own personality what they want to do some people will be like no 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 i want work 
family and um and and community to all be notably digitized in some different ways okay and someone else will say no i want my community to be rock climbers i want that concrete reality and i don't really like kind of the online communities because it kind of feels weird to me. However, I love working online because then I can work, I like to do my job online because then I can do, I can work anywhere and say, go rock climbing. You're going to have this vast, um, this vast plurality, I suppose, multitude of different customizations relative to what individuals want to do for their different personality. But that means you have to keep both the digital and the robust, and the digital and the analog robust. So you can have that assortment of different possibilities and different things. Likewise, religions are always at their best when they keep the religion and the mysticism robust. The religious and the spiritual, like both sides of it have a robust tradition. Those are the ones that tend to survive because everyone in the, like people in the congregation have different levels of, yeah, I like, you know, 70% religion, 30% mysticism. Well, I like 80% mysticism and 20% religion. Like it all breaks down relative. Well, I like speaking in tongues and you like to sing hymns. Like it, it varies. And Right now, the conversation on the digital versus analog, I, I think it's lacking that customization because there's just this assumption that everything is going to go digital. And that's like so many of the people who are like, oh, religion will all just go spiritual and it will all just go mystical. Yeah, it can. And doesn't work. So great. Uh, so I, I think that having that space of customization is going to be very important. Mm. Well said. That whole, the spiritual and not religious, I have this really deep contention and I've never really been able to fully understand it, but it comes forward all the time because there's so many people who have that identification now. And I, I think I'm hearing it when I hear someone sort of distinguish themselves, oh, but it's not new age, you know? And I think when they're doing that move, they're saying, but I'm not the spiritual, but not religious type. And it seems like there's this weird way in which that like movement has been taken up by like a physicalism or a materialism. And now it's almost mm. like this, like, cause it's spiritual. It's almost this ground of justification for this absurd, like explosion of plurality in all these different directions. But it, cause of this, like the spiritual sort of undertone and like this sort of set of sort of these few words that have have been labeled as like being spiritually connotated and then in that space between it sort of feels like they they can get away from anything to get get away with yes. anything yes and I, I actually find that quite terrifying and i find it terrifying in the context of people who are genuinely trying to take up this effort to establish a new normativity and it, it sort of feels like it takes one new age hand grenade and like all of your efforts can be like exploded or more probably more accurately imploded um but it, i don't know mate, like it almost feels like we haven't yet reached a criticality where people are ready to shoulder the burden of religion again because i think in some senses that's what that machine is like it's not nice to put on the religious coat but it's better than the bloody gnostic yeah. infinity that just sort of burns off into oblivion oh absolutely um, i think you put it so well with i just want to comment on the gnosticism as a hand yeah, that's why religions are always worried to death of mysticism because if someone walks in the congregation and says god told me x that is a massive deal like we either have to call you a liar or we have to believe you have the authority of god and we have to change everything like just one person claiming God said X is a huge deal. It's a huge problem. Like it's a huge issue. And if you don't have the mechanisms by which to sort through, think through and integrate with that reality when it occurs, the whole thing blows up just like that. So, I mean, that it's just, you and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that's, that's, that describes no. it so well with that tension. Yeah. The, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, respond to is your point around this like the illusion of podcasts i i very much feel like i've been through that and there is a point where it negates itself for sure and at that point it's like oh if i want like a substance i'm gonna have to take some of these fields or thinkers and actually like pursue the depth that's in there and it, that that seems to be the only thing I think I heard Cadell say an unbearable density of thought. And I was like, yes, that's exactly what 
you're wanting to actually get to and it's almost like the podcast create this sense of like i'm all like i'm i almost am there to that point of that unbearable density but i just need to get over the sort of next hill and then i'll have that like realization and it just sort of keeps going and i think like beyond beyond going deeper into certain disciplines there's also what you were saying around it being like i've been thinking about this in terms of a rich pragmatism so the ability to take information and ground it pragmatically but the richness sort of contextualize the fact that you don't want to go from one flat ontology into another by bottoming out into like a truth with a lowercase t or something like that sure and i think for me personally it's like i only ever care about learning something if i can apply it to what i'm creating or the people that i'm relating to and what what's interesting about that is i don't i don't watch a lot of like uh recreational stuff ever i do enjoy a good film like a, a good film that makes you think is like i actually think there's nothing better than that in terms of educating you about like life I know you had the thing on fiction being the mathematics of the humanities and it's like, yes. Um, I actually think I'll probably reach a point in my life where I just purely go into works of art to try to learn rather than trying to go more into the sort of systemized abstract, just because there's such a, like, there's such a wealth and a richness of information in these great works of art that, yeah, just almost, make thing other things like math seem in, in a way comical obviously math has a place and there's a great like wonder and beauty in it and also a great utility no well I, i'll just comment quickly yeah um, please go for it that one of the ways like if i were to talk about a particular creed that may help with the balance of the analog and the digital so i'll tell you something um i actually were quite um so I, and i don't say this just you know but i'll i'll say it um I force myself to write something about everything I listen to. So then that puts a cap on how much I listen to. Like if I listen to something, I require myself to process it in a writing form. Well, that sucks. Uh, you know, so like, you know, in a way, but also if I, that's how you learn it. Like you have to, if you're going to listen to this, you need to write it. You need to write it out. Maybe it's just a comment, but usually it's a paper or usually it's something I have a book of editions that I call them and you go through and you write it. Well, that right there kind of helps um, one, integrate with what you learn and two, make sure you don't get lost down the podcast rabbit hole because if ultimately you have to write everything you listen to, or you have to bring it into relation, which probably means you have to write it to figure out how to bring it into relation. Well, then you become aware of what you're going to listen to and why and, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not saying I haven't ever watched the cat video without watch, writing a journal entry, but when, when you have that kind of habit, I find that also is kind of a, a check and balance that, that can be nice. And I wanted to add, yeah, I don't watch a lot of recreational stuff, a good film, uh, is rare these days, but you, it's hard to beat a good film. Uh, and also, too, on your point on that density of um, well thought, and then um, on like art, the the comment I was going to say, I always find this hilarious. Like um, when I go to write a paper on say Aristotle, or I, I tried to talk about what I call Aristotle's chain, the logic that connects all of his books. I think it ended up being ten pages. I went to write on the first stanza of Notes from a Supreme Fiction on Wallace Stevens, and it was 52 pages before I even got halfway because there's so much going on in this freaking poem. And that's how literature can be, actually. Great works of art. Like, if you really, really start trying to think it through, it's just like an infinite explosion. And I think, and I'm not obviously trying to say Wallace Stevens is necessarily better than Aristotle. What I'm trying to say is that in great works of art, you actually find this entire insane dimension of thought that can come out and come together that's very emergent and non-reductionist that's the other key like there, there's like a whole logic at play and it actually teaches you to, to think according to more of a dynamic logic than a linear logic literature mm. will teach you new forms of logic especially like great poetry and asbury you know i mentioned to stevens i could go on but um like great poetry if you really sit down to think it through can teach you new forms of logic mm. yeah well well said that's definitely been my experience I, I often i'll finish some sort of like book or maybe it's a film and there's something about the way it lingers that makes everything in the 
purely conceptual domain feel two dimensional? Yes. Well, in that too, to Mr. Mr. Landry's point, when you have a culture of people that aren't doing literature and they're not doing reading, then they are not regularly exposed to the experience of a thing disclosing itself in this kind of infinite fashion. So why would they ever have a heuristics of beauty? You know, Viveki will talk about the heuristics mm -hmm. of beauty where you view reality. It's the opposite of the uh, hermeneutics of suspicion from, you know, Ricoeur. And it's a notion that instead of reality concealing things, beauty is the idea that reality is always unveiling things. And no matter what it unveils, there's more to be unveiled. And so then what Mr. L you know, what Forrest was saying is that when you have a shared beauty and a shared attunement, then I can trust that you are also toward the world in a manner that believes something can come out of it and you're not toward the world trying to deconstruct it. So I can trust you. You know, if you have a hermeneutics of suspicion, then whatever I bring forth or whatever community I make or whatever world I try to present to us, you're going to tear down. But if we have beauty, then I know I can bring something forth or point something out or say, man, there's a lot going on in this poem. And the first thing you say won't be, I don't see it. A hermeneutics of beauty means I can tell you I see something and you'll say, well, let me look and mean it. So now there's a trust there. Now there's a there's a vulnerability. But when you have a culture of people that are not engaged in the arts as such, I think it's a mistake to conflate art with beauty. You know, those are different categories, even if they overlap. But there is something about great art that teaches you to be in the business of letting a thing disclose itself, like open itself up to you by you sitting there and giving it a chance to do it. I promise you, if you read through the snowman of Wallace Steve really quickly it won't do anything and seem really strange but if you sit there really sit there and go through follow the syllable count how is the rhyme scheme structured why does he use this word here instead of a different word uh, and then you got this really like the snowman's a masterpiece um where all these things coming up well that trains you to then go into the world and instead of saying oh this tree is lumber heidegger standing reserve you say wait Hold on, let me let it be, as Heidegger will say, let it come forth like that poem, and suddenly you have a phenomenon. And if I know you do that too, then we can have a community and we may build something together. Because why is it so hard to build something with people? One, because building stuff is hard, but two, because things are so fragile. Like, hmm. it, I, I, you know, Rand is so good. Like, um, it takes the genius of, a, you know, to make the statue of David, it takes a long time and a lot of genius to bring out a statue of David or something like that, right? It takes five minutes to destroy it and any group can do it. You know, destruction takes seconds and anyone can do it. Whereas great creations take a lot of time, a lot of sacrifice and a lot of work and a lot of genius. So there is always a disadvantage to creation. There is always a disadvantage to beauty. And if I can't know hmm. that you don't have a hermeneutics of beauty, I would never build with you because you're just going to tear it down. And it only takes you to have one bad day to burn it to the ground or for me to and to burn it to the ground. I need to know that we have a shared attunement that we can trust that that creative act will be able to emerge and not be torn down over the years so we could see it through to the end. So like that shared attunement also leads to a shared willingness to create together or to commit together or to put something forth together uh, and to see how it may arise, um, which takes time and therefore takes trust and therefore takes possibility. And I have to believe you have a shared disclosure with me to engage in that, but it's hard um, it's hard to find people who do that if we've all been trained to reduce a poem to its meaning. Well, what, what does this poem mean? When was Wallace Stevens born? You know, what's the main character? As if you can reduce a poem from its whole into its parts, which indeed people are trained to do. And that leads, of course, to the reductionism that's so problematic. And do you know what underlies that very notion is this ability to undergo work. I'm using work yes. loosely here, but it's like, it takes an effortfulness to actually get that flywheel turning of that disclosure. But once it's going, it becomes actually self-evident that it's for itself and yes. that actually the very process and the kinds of flow states that come out of that are their own sort of, they're, they're their own justification. Like For Forrest speaks to how in that conversation, how the chances of one of those people who have won the dominator hierarchy actually engaging in a process of attunement or discernment is just incredibly low because of the fact that it takes time and patience yes. and like a real, yes. like sort of rather than trying to just 
cheat the system, cut the corner, optimize for a certain metric. It actually requires this very like slow moving, patient, like balancing act of like falling over and getting back up. And it's sort of like the very early on when I was trying to understand relationship and my, it's interesting, my kind of, I had this intuition from quite young that there was a certain level of like intimacy and connection that people could have together that just wasn't present in the culture. And I started, started kind of pursuing how, how that could be brought about. And what came to me very early on was it felt like there was just this fundamental difference. And if it wasn't present, then there was no point trying to pursue that relationship. And it was simply the, I probably was thinking about it as like a showing up in good faith, but it was like that willingness to interpret and to participate generously. Like if you're not willing to be generous in your attempts to create meaning and relationship, then you're just going to get nowhere. <laughs> Cause the very, like, like you said, the fragility of it, like any, getting it off the ground or getting that ember, that first ember and sort of fanning it into existence, any sort of like closed minded rigidness, a, a is a logic is just going to sort of snuff it into, into nothingness, back into nothingness. You said that so well. And there's a, there is a profound wisdom in identifying that a person is going to snuff whatever is created and thus not to engage in it because it becomes a toxic thing. But this also is speaking to the, like when we're like, oh, we're going to have everyone be online and everyone on digital community. Well, there are people, it takes one person one toxic person in a community to potentially destroy the whole thing, to tear it all down, right? Um, and yet that same toxic person in maybe a more analog space may not be toxic, right? Uh, and so because of the way that they relate to the world and maybe they were, you know, like they'll talk about shoulder to shoulder per people versus face to face people. Maybe in the online communities, they're much more face to face than shoulder to shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder is like, we work on cars together. We do sports together. We don't really talk a lot, but we do things together. And that's a profound form of intimacy. And then you have people like Gary Chapman talk about love languages and stuff. And maybe we even mentioned Myers-Briggs so we can make the algorithm happy. No, 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 Instagram, whatever it is now, I don't even know. Uh, the new personality test. But, um, but like there are a lot of shoulder to shoulder people who in shoulder to shoulder context are not toxic but in face to face they become toxic because they don't know how to do that and it's not their language so if all they have is digital opportunity there's a lot of people that are going to be toxic who actually wouldn't be toxic in other circumstances and then you just have straight toxic people and you have to have those sorting mechanisms or else the whole thing could be torn down um and it and it really like beauty the ability to see beauty as landry you know force was getting at um, screams also an ability to honor something other than yourself. So it screams you're not egotistical. Like if you can like really, really be caught up in the beauty of something, that means you're attuned to something outside of yourself. Well, if you're, if you're attuned to there actually being a reality outside of yourself, then you will see value in creating a thing that you put in a reality outside of yourself and that exists beyond you and maybe even not for you because things can be good that are not for you, that are in fact for others becoming other in a Hegelian way. So the, so the particular attunement of beauty screams trust you know, all these different things that we are describing that if you don't have, it's going to be problematic. And what concerns me um, is, you know, with the digital, like the pure digital space, there does seem to be, this is something I've been thinking about. It does seem to be that it is very, it is more likely to have beautiful experiences in the analog than the digital. And I say that now I'm going to have to go through what beauty is, which boy, howdy, that's an open, uh, that's a can of worms. Um, but beauty, <clears throat> so beauty, in my opinion, is not merely a thing where you say that's a beautiful painting. One of the reasons why we're so confused about beauty is we try to locate it in an object as opposed to beauty, beauty being something very holistic. So I'll give an example of what I mean by this. Um, you're, so it's 1825 and you're out in the field working. You're, you know, maybe 14 or whatever. And your uncle says he got, he's going to take you to a, what's that symphony? Oh, okay. That's weird. I don't really know what that is. And he takes you to this, this, this place in the evening. You get dressed up. You never get dressed up, but you're going to do it. It's one of the few times you've been taken to town to do it. And he sits you in the, the seat and you're sitting, you're looking around. And you're like, oh my gosh. And you hear the premiere of Beethoven's Ninth. 
Is that a beautiful experience or is it merely subjective? You are hearing Beethoven's Ninth before it is Beethoven's Ninth. And no one in the history of the world has ever heard Beethoven's Ninth. And you very rarely hear music. You work in the field. Music is rare. And when you hear it, it's mostly hymns or, you know, acapella or different things. So music is rare. And this will be the only time in your life when you hear Beethoven's Ninth. And you will never again hear it. Is it objectively beautiful or is it subjectively beautiful? There is no doubt whatsoever that that experience would change the cause and effect of your life. The world would be a place in which music like that is possible. And what you would see as possible in the world would be forever different. How you carried yourself in the world would be different. And you would tell people, man, I'm telling you guys, I heard this thing, it was, it was music. And they're like, yeah, John, you've been telling that story for 30 years. I'm telling you, it happened. I'm telling you. That change on your life would be objective. Your life would literally be changed. And the, and the key to understanding the objectivity of beauty is the strike of beauty that changes your course and effect, not the aesthetics of the object. If you were to ask, is Beethoven's Ninth beautiful today in 2023, you get into a large argument about what is aesthetics and the forms of different things, because now you can listen to Beethoven's Ninth whenever you want. You don't have to go to a concert hall to, to hear it. And that removes the holistic experience of what makes it strike you in a manner that changes your life forever because it is reproduced. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. It's trade-offs, but it makes it more difficult to understand that beauty is objective when it is in a reproductional structure like that. And it's not a contextual. The ob the, so this is the point. Beethoven's Ninth in the 1825 thought experiment I gave you is objectively beautiful, but Beethoven's Ninth on an MP3 player is no longer so objectively beautiful because now it is entered into a different context where it's more subjective. You see what I'm saying? So the one of oneness goes a long way. Walter Benjamin talks about this, like with the loss of aura and all. The one of oneness in the entire holistic experience is what makes beauty an objective reality that then changes what is possible in the world in any Everyone in that concert hall now has a special connection that no one else on planet Earth will ever have because no one else will be in that situation. So there's a unique kind of communal bond there, a, a kind of special experience that cannot be replicated. Okay, That radical level of one of oneness necessarily is part of analog reality. Digital space is inherently recorded. It is her inherently reproduced. It is inherently customizable. Here's the other problem. You say, well, Daniel, like, there's like infinite creative possibilities. The very fact that you customize the artistic experience that you encounter greatly reduces the probability of it striking you because you chose it. But with the Beethoven's Ninth example, you had no idea what you were getting into. That's the key. Beauty has to feel like something you don't pick. It has to like storm into your world, break through the clouds and show up and say, I am here, what now? You know, that is how beauty is objective. But when beauty is customizable and subjectively chosen, then it loses its power to strike you. And so of course, in this context, it seems like beauty is mere taste and preference. Of course, it seems like in this context that beauty is just a meaningless academic debate because the objectivity of beauty requires the strike of which requires the one of one context that feels like something is breaking through completely unexpected. And that's very difficult to have now in painting, music, and different forms of art. I think it's actually more likely in sports, um, athletics, you can have this form of beauty that can come through because of the radical one of oneness that is more likely or the performance as a whole. But even that can be reproduced because we've all seen, seen a million uh, 30 for 30 ESPN specials or different things like that. So what I am concerned about is in the digital space, the very context of the digital, because there is so much reproduction, because it is customizable, that you cannot have the experiences of beauty that strike you and bring a deeper sense of an ontological reality that is only found in the analog. So if everyone goes to the digital, the beauty in that strike is going to be much less, which is going to make make it far more difficult to have the shared attunement that we are talking about. And then the hope that comes from the realization that the world can be a place where something can break itself into your life and change you uh, in profound 
ways. I think that becomes much more difficult to find in the digital, and thus it will be more difficult to have the trust, the community, the comments, and so on and so forth that Mr. Um, Forrest Landry is talking about. Because funny enough, I'm actually making the argument here that strangely, a digital space may have less creativity in a funny way, be precisely because of the ease of the creation, the lack of the commitment, the lack of the work, hit a button, new picture of Hegel from the, from the dolly, new text that comes out. I would argue all of that in a way is an explosion of a kind of creative possibility, but also a massive reduction of the creative process that works on the character of the person in the creative act. And that is ultimately what is critical because the work of pouring yourself into a novel that everyone thinks is a waste of time that you work on for 20 years and redo time and time again and that you truly believe in, that is the work that is central to creativity that changes your attunement, changes how you relate to the world and changes how you relate to other people that leads to trust and the the tears, the sweat, and the blood that becomes the ground of a courageous relationship that can accomplish so much more. So yes, Dolly will give us infinite photographs, infinite pictures, and I actually don't think the technology is bad because, you know, there's a lot of paintings that will come into existence that otherwise would not come into existence because of Dolly and different things like that. However, the great, 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 great danger of it is that it removes the creative work itself on the individual that is so primary for the formation of communities and individuals that can then look to the sky and really believe in the possibility of beauty breaking forth because they've seen their own ability to participate in the bringing in of something that's beautiful. To be someone like a Beethoven who brings in a Ninth Symphony that can then premiere it in a world that has never heard of the Ninth Symphony. And now it's hard to imagine the world as being a, a place where there was no, no such thing as a Ninth Symphony. Once beauty breaks in, it's difficult to imagine beauty not breaking in. It becomes part of the very constitution of the world. And that's basically the point. The constitution of the world is now forever changed. And you can be part of that if you so commit to it. Well said. <laughs> wow, yeah. So the two of the things that are really striking me about that is one, the the giving up of control like that the the beauty being contingent upon realities that extend far be not just beyond you but far beyond you and i guess that gives it that sort of otherworldliness that draws you beyond yourself and then the other aspect is the participation in the beauty and you can imagine a world with the ai and the robotics where we essentially cut ourselves out of the process that makes life worthwhile in a nutshell right and that that's yeah. terrifying like that itself if we could actually fathom that would probably be enough to pull the plug on something like many of these endeavors okay. and like you say there will be goodness that comes from them but i actually i don't know if you've forest had a conversation with evan mcmullen about ai alignment have you come across mm -hmm. that by any chance i have not watched that but i will have to because evan mcmullen i that yeah, i enjoy listening to it so that's fascinating huh yeah, that, that was on the Liminal Dow YouTube page. If you can't find okay. it, let me know and I'll fire you a link on Voicecraft. Um, but yeah, for, just I brought that in because Forrest is actually, he, he believes that GPT, he, he believes general, artificial general intelligence won't be able to be aligned. And he has like ov obviously some very well thought out, thought out uh, reasoning as to why that is. And he thinks that GPT-3 is already too general to, because uh, he thinks narrow, some narrow, narrow AIs can be aligned, but GPT-3 is already too general to reach alignment, which is a really interesting claim. Um, but yeah, it's like coming, coming back to beauty. I'm interested how you see beauty's relationship to novelty. Cause it's sort of like, it's like, to me, if you take novelty and you kind of it's sort of like if i really take novelty at its face value it really isn't beauty it's kind of like almost antithetical to beauty in that it's this like moment of sort of like ah but it doesn't have like the punch or the follow-through like it's almost like that that's the strike of beauty it's it actually resonates through your entire being and so strongly that it can actually bring those around you who are standing witness to the beauty with you all into this state of resonance like it has like a depth to it and a magnitude whereas it's almost like novelty is this kind of superficial difference that 
it's more like a breadcrumb trail that never actually gets you. And it's the podcast versus say the, the long piece of literature. A fantastic question. I think um, there are a few things that get confused as kind of forms of the strike that I'm describing. So you have novelty, you, you have shock. You know, there's a lot of people that have like a shock in their work that it's like good, um, a twist, like you'll see in storytelling. And these are all big mistakes because just, mm -hmm. just because something surprising occurs does not mean one's life has been changed. Uh, I can be, um, I can come around the corner and find my youngest child there dressed like a bit like a giant bat rabbit and be shocked, but that is not necessarily going to change the horizon of possibilities uh, according to which I live my life. When people have a beautiful, it's like the asshole, you meant, uh, a lot of the site so people will have a single psychedelic psychedelic experience and their entire life changes just like that um you know and how they view everything and they change well religions would talk about mystical experiences beautific visions the same way you have once in your entire life everything totally changes that is the a kind of defining feature of beauty as opposed to pleasant nice looking surprise shock and so on and so forth mm. now the strike of beauty if we use it that the language i was using tends to be novel because your life was one way and now it's another so there's a novelty to the beauty because it introduces a variable that changes your course but it is not the case that everything novel is beautiful or anything like that i mean because you're actually most of the time you're encountering new things, right? I mean, you go down the sidewalk, there's a new can to the side, there's a new tree. Like we constantly encounter newness. You could even get into kind of a Deleuze, you know, where every single difference in repetition actually has a kind of newness to it, right? But it doesn't necessarily strike us or anything. Maybe it should strike us. We can get into some practices to see the originality and uniqueness and everything that could be very beneficial. Uh, but, it, but newness does not necessarily strike us as the way of beauty. However, one of the reasons why often beauty has some kind of novelty to it is because novelty, because beauty struggles to strike us if there are preset complexes for what it is before we encounter it. Um, and mm -hmm. what I mean by that is if you see photographs of Paris, France, before you go to Paris, France, you experience it differently than someone who has never seen photographs of Paris, France, before they go to Paris, France, right? Because before, because when you see photographs or you watch movies, you have preset ideas of what the thing is going to be like. And then when you go there, it becomes very difficult not to filter the experience through those preset ideas. Um, and Walker Percy had a, a marvelous essay about this problem, where he kind of, kind of tongue-in-cheek says, if you really want to understand Shakespeare, you have to go into a biology classroom, sit, sit down at the dissection board and find a sonnet there. And the point he is saying is that you have to encounter Shakespeare outside of the English classroom because when you go in the English classroom, there's a preset logic and structure by which you interpret the sonnet so it doesn't strike you. So he's like, you're actually, you know, you actually may have a chance if you do it on a dissection board in a biology classroom. Uh, quite funny. But he really is saying, and Walter Benjamin aligns with this as well, is that with all the photographs, like, for example, if you can hear Samuel Barber's agio for strings before you go hear it live, the experience will be different because you've heard the music before. Now, we can't go to a live concert of every single piece of music ever, so MP3s are great. And also, it's lovely to be able to have agio for strings on repeat when one needs it, uh, but, uh, but to create those different effects, right? But something is lost in that. So often, when beauty strikes... There, there can't be a preset complex because if there was, that reduces the strike. You see what I'm saying? So that's why novelty will align often with beauty because it's a new, but, but the term, I, I kind of prefer saying the, instead of like novelty, oh, it's new. It's the lack of expectation, the lack of a preset complex, the lack of a reference point to filter through. That's mostly what's going on that creates the stride effect, not the fact that it's new, but it gets, but people confuse it with newness and thus say, oh, novelty is the key to art. Novelty is the key. Now, and also note, I'm trying to maintain kind of robust distinctions between categories of art and beauty and really trying to locate beauty in this kind of holistic experience that is not just Beethoven's Ninth, but the entire context in which the performance occurs, because I actually think the likelihood of thinking that beauty is merely subjective and preferential skyrockets when you only consider it a category of art. Like, once you do that, then it's like, well, why is Picasso better than Cezanne? I mean, come on, Picasso's not beautiful. No, it is beautiful. If you knew the edge, you get in these endless di discourses that don't even ultimately go anywhere because you're 
in the whole time you're doing that D, D course, you're in the preset complex of the art discourse itself. And so nothing strikes you. And so unfortunately, the reduction of beauty to discussing art very often can end up removing the possibility of actually being struck by beauty, which then problematically makes it seem like you're right to say that beauty is merely subjective because you only ever have experiences where beauty is subjective. So you get enclosed in a world where that's all you ever experience and that becomes very problematic. Um, and uh, and also it becomes problematic to say that tree is beautiful or that, you know, that fake, that, that one object in nature as opposed to the strike itself, which is very mysteriously. Mysterious, like the spirit comes, strikes you and it goes. Like there's something very mysterious about beauty, um, but actually incredibly concrete when it occurs. It's mysterious to explain when it happens, but when it occurs, it's very concrete. How, what, what kind, what would be the, the constitution of a religion that was able to create structure and forms that kept people open to beauty whilst maintaining the stability so that it all doesn't, because I've met people who, and I, I sort of have perceived it as a certain immaturity, but not, and not, I'm not dismissing what they're trying to do, but it's like they, they don't want you to label things and they don't want you to analyze things. And they're, they're trying to preserve the immediacy and the way the immediacy, like, it, it it allows you to sort of maintain a receptivity that keeps the aliveness present. But in in doing that, there we we come to times where we end up in a sort of gnostic dream because of that, because nothing is actually being made concrete, and therefore there's no there's actually no shared ground on which we can like come through all of that chaos and into some sort of functional world. And so I guess, and perhaps this is one of the things that we're grappling with, like right now is like, what, what kind of, what kind of structure is capable of creating the stability whilst maintaining our relationship to beauty? Magnificent. Uh, I actually think that if the digital and the analog are going to get together, it's going to be a way where the analog is able to use the digital to enhance the ability to have a horizon to go into the analog where you see more beauty and you kind of have a structure that is using them to inform one another, right? Because if you can like learn online how to relate to people outside of a libidinal economy, well, then that might increase your confidence to go into relationships to relate in a manner that reduces drama, uh, that it reduces conflict, all of which can posture you in a state of maybe more of a rest, kind of a Sabbath re relaxation, which is precisely a place where beauty can strike you because it is not filtered through drama or you're cut off from the possibility of beauty striking you because of drama. Now, there's a lot more things to be said. So, um, yeah. Uh, so this is where, like, if, again, if we use the Christian structure, there's this radical tension of saying, okay, so we have to somehow teach people practical ways to life, have a community, but also point point to a mystical reality that is always present. Now, Catholic, the genius, I will say, the genius of Catholicism on this problem was sacramental ontology, which you find in Aquinas, which is the notion that all of creation is sacramental in that it's all a sign pointing to a transcendent reality beyond itself. So when you look at a tree, that is actually pointing to eternity or pointing to God because it's all created by God. And if it's created by God, it must somehow participate in God, not completely because that would be an idol and that would be a heresy, but everything in reality actually discloses some sort of revelation about the character of God because God created it and God cares about it. And he's trying to restore it through resurrection and insurrection, you know, in, 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 in um, incarnationally resurrected. I said insurrection, so it took me a minute there. Um, but like a sacramental view of reality turns everything into a work of art if one is able to cultivate the Holy Spirit to see it as such and to encounter it as such. Um, and that doesn't mean every work of art will strike with the beauty, as we said, but it has the potential of having a deep aesthetic. And here's the other thing. Sacramental ontology blends aesthetics and metaphysics, which is really quite brilliant, where then the metaphysical reality of everything precisely means it's an aesthetic reality as well. And I would actually say bringing the aesthetic and the metaphysics together is like the goal. That's like the big thing. Like, and I actually think Deleuze took a crack at it and it, there's a lot of beauty in it, but it needs the Hegel 
epistemology, but I'll, I'll reserve that. Um, and maybe there's a paper that proves it, or it's just a bunch of words on paper. I'm not sure. Might be an argument, might be words, hard to say. Um, but anyway, when you have aesthetics and metaphysics come together, then you care about metaphysics because they attract you into it. And metaphysics is no longer an abstraction. It is the aura itself around things that make you care about them. So metaphysics becomes a kind of aura when it is aesthetics. Things get in a metaphysical aura, to use Walter Benjamin's term, that then has a kind of mystery in the thing if you can only attune yourself to it in a manner to be at it that way. So this sacramental structure, if we think of the idea of aura, how is it that the analog and the digital might relate in a manner that makes everything in the analog have an aura? And how can everything in the digital contribute to the ability to have an aura or something of that nature? Um, yeah, that's a million dollar question. That's very difficult. That's going to get into the particular practices and the particular creeds of the digital community and what they do. So, for example, I would say that if you literally don't listen to a podcast unless you write something about it and thus integrate it into yourself, the very fact that it's thus integrated into yourself increases the probability that you then carry what you learned in that podcast into the world that then changes how you see things, right? And if let's say you focus on saying, I really want to be able to really be struck by beauty, well, then you prioritize books, metaphysics, philosophies, theologies, or literature of which literally teach you how to encounter and participate in beauty. Then you write something out about that, integrate it into your being, and carry it into the world so that can occur. And then what you encounter in the world, you bring back to the digital, give it to the people in the communities there so they can bring it out into their analog, back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, right? But definitely... There has to be, right now, the language of the digital and the analog is the digital will replace the analog. Not that the digital will be a way to create aura in the analog. Not that it will be a way to train us to have a horizon of aura in the analog. And the analog, in turn, will disclose itself almost in a Heideggerian way, in new ways, precisely because of the attunement we gain from online communities. There must be this, di I dare I say, dialectical, incarnational, transubstantiate, maybe transubstantiate sort of structure, a kind of sacramental ontology between these two things. And then the communities design themselves to do it. And if that doesn't occur, it's going to be a replacement structure, which nobody wins. Yeah, and well, well said. And there's something interesting about something like, say, augmented reality, because that, that seems to be people don't want to go the whole way with transhumanism they're like yeah but like let's let's at least bring it down you know and like let, let's augment reality and then we can have like the digital overlaying the physical or the analog and that's going to make it far greater but what you're pointing to there is the it is not the form that is that is the beauty it's the attunement be to the form that takes you beyond the form that is the beauty and therefore simply having a heads-up display that is full of more concepts or forms is not going to do anything but pro probably it will do something and it will overwhelm the shit out of you and then you'll end up yes. having that tragic moment where you actually do open up to real beauty but sure yeah it's i really really like what you're sort of this the central thing you're driving home here is this like the the reciprocity between the digital and the analog and kind of I think that the the ultimate challenge is going to be the willingness to confront the the tragedy that's part and parcel of the beauty of the analog. Like that the ability to do that and and that takes courage, right? Like you you have to have and that also obviously then ties into intrinsic motivation, which I know you've you and I have talked about that a little bit before, and I know that's something you've been thinking about a lot but it the the way the way in which the digital can equip someone to then from within themselves step out and confront the analog in a way that actually discloses the beauty of the analog to them completely uh, well again to me like <clears throat> Like, why is it that Gnosticism or, you know, ignoring matter in the body in favor of the spirit is so tempting? Because you can escape pain. 
it becomes a kind of deus ex for all your problems. Like, you know, you don't have to confront things because you can just turn to the spiritual, right? And it's just fascinating to me because I guess so much of the language about the digital or everything analog becoming digital just reminds me of these ancient debates that occurred in theologies and religion that were like, no, we don't need to worry about matter because we're all going to go to heaven. Jesus will come back, rapture. You know, it's all an illusion. Every single theology, every religion had logic that formally matches so much of the conversation between the analog and the digital. Um, and arguably, I would also say a reason to highlight beauty is because religions, in my opinion, have always been at their strongest when aesthetic thinking is primary. It is at its very central. Not goodness, not truth, beauty. And that may seem counterintuitive, but beauty is what attracts people into a story. Like when you find something beautiful, you put down your preset notions, you become vulnerable, and you're pulled in. Whereas when I tell you, like, if I use a truth and say, hey, you need to believe Jesus is Lord, it's probably, I'm just throwing something at you. But when I show you Jesus, oh, you may be pulled in. So the funny thing is people don't even care about truth if it's beautiful because it just seems like a totalitarian thing. And if it's not beautiful, why would they think it's good, right? So like you can like, but goodness, that will, goodness is beautiful. No, no, the, the order is that beauty has to be kind of the primary display the kind of coming out of goodness, truth, and beauty together. All three, now I will say that all three always have to be together. If you have beauty without truth, then it's kind of like deception. It's kind of uh, um, kind of pulling you in. Seduction is like a seduction thing. So you do have to have the all temptress. three. Yeah, it's a temptress kind of thing. If you have beauty and truth but not goodness, um, well, then it's evil. Uh, so, you know, it becomes bad. So you have to have all three at all times. And yet... There is something about the, you could say, the relation. When the relation is primary, then beauty is primary. Not because it is the only thing, but because the relation between those three is beautiful. And when a, and when a theology emphasizes the beauty, it then emphasizes the relation between the three infinites, of which then what have we been saying? That all of philosophy today is turning out like, hey, we got to go into intersuppositional or we're screwed, right? We have to go intersuppositional or we're in huge, huge trouble. When theologies emphasize beauty, they often ended up intersuppositional without realizing it, which then helped them thrive. Uh, because then they would pull people in, relate to it a different way, be transformed by it, and then they would go out and share that transformation in a beautiful way. So beauty has to, I think, be very primary in the thinking. And so the question becomes of how does the digital create aura for the analog and in the analog, of which then changes people how they come back to the digital. And that attunement, it is in the attunement itself that makes possible the beauty. And the evidence of the beauty is the, the change itself of how people live their lives, right? And if the digital, here's the thing, like if there's no analog, there's like no test that the digital is actually changing people. Like in the same way, like if there's no analog, then there's no place to go and show that the digital has done anything good, true, and beautiful. <laughs> like there's no world to carry it out and to show that they are therefore different, therefore to believe there's a beauty, therefore to believe that there's a metaphysical depth to that digital. And so it will become a kind of flat, it will become a kind of flat ontology. Um, and indeed the thing is why I think intrinsic motion is a big deal. If you have the ability to see the world as beautiful or to experience beauty or to believe that beauty is possibly out there, well, beauty attracts and thus you're motivated. When beauty is central, you achieve intrinsic motivation um, because you have the ability to see life in a manner that attracts you to it. But if you don't have beauty, it's very difficult for you yourself to create something that attracts you and pulls you forward, right? So beauty and motivation go together. And here's the thing. What you find beautiful, you also love. What you tend to love, you tend to create habits around. And, what, and your habits tend to form you. Like you as a person is formed by your habits. And when we don't have beauty in a culture, then we don't, people, we don't have people forming habits to form selves in terms of beauty. They only have selves that they inform in terms of truth and goodness, which then becomes um, information and ideology. Because when you only have like ethics or goodness outside of a beautiful framework in ergo a harmony, it just becomes ideology. It becomes all the political wards, Trump versus liberal, it's all of that. Or you just have information. Because truth without beauty and goodness is just information. It's just data. So everyone today is now forming their identity in selves with either ideology or with data. And that leads to a vast reductionist in the inability to then encounter the world in terms of a horizon that gives an aura that you can bring to people to help them escape being mere data 
or mere ideology as well, because you haven't made beauty central. So it's very, very important to make it central to then get that intrinsic motivation and to get that transformation of um of self creation, self identity, and intrinsic motivation in that self creation. What what sorts of capacities do you think the digital possesses that will enable that aura? Because for me, at the moment dialogue is definitely central um obviously there are forms of media that maybe also have that capacity but as you were saying before it seems like a lot of beauty and aura requires a level of participation that isn't actually easy to create in the digital because a lot of the digital is just replication and secondhand consumption and engineered choices that have very little chance that you'll encounter something unexpected sure. yeah so do you, what thoughts do you have around that that's an excellent in one, question in one sense it's like there, there's so much in the digital but then in another sense there's like very little substance as well so it's sort of it's there's really another weird, weird it's really tension weird. It's super weird. Yeah. It's like it's like it's like not it's like spirituality and Gnosticism. It's like the most important thing in the world, and it has literally no character uh, because it can't be defined or ana like or represented in material form. So what is it? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's this weird thing that happens with spirituality and Gnosticism, and the same that can happen with the digital. No, it's an excellent question. Um, definitely dialogue is a part of it. The ability to have intersuppositional experiences to make you realize, oh, wow, stuff can emerge between people that is unsuspect unexpected, and there's a transformation in how time passes, because, wow, a lot of time's gone by, I have no idea. Uh, time changes, your ability to focus in on a person, have that kind of I, thou, boober way, like all of these things emerge is that you can get a unique training in through the internet that I don't think was so readily available in the in the analog. So that's an amazing thing uh, because in the analog, it was just improbable that you would encounter multiple people that were similarly attuned enough to have the dialogos thing occur. It, of course, it theoretically can. Uh, I see it, you know, Bernard would always do the hip hop ciphers and you see kind of something like that. A cipher is an amazing example of the emergence possibilities and then the courage to enter it etc etc but the digital space allows examples of intersuppositional possibilities which then once you see well the world is a place where those things are possible and so it's always like if, if in your life you ever see one green cat the world is forever a place where green cats can happen, even if it only happens once. So likewise, witnessing or being part of something intersuppositional means the world is always a place where that thing is possible. So it changes the horizon in different things, right? So the dialogue is quite important. Um, definitely the second thing that can open up is the ability to experiment quickly, to be inspired. Like you can look through Dolly images and be inspired, right? You can experiment with different things and you can go quickly. Unfortunately, there will be a temptation mm -hmm. to just do that, but the ability to go through so much and to receive inspiration of which that very inspiration can help um, the experience of aura, that can be good if one learns um, to, uh, to, 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 to move out of that, right? I mean, in the same way, like it's easier to be a writer because of digital um, Word, Word, Microsoft Word, because uh, I can edit, I don't have to print something off every single time, which then opens writing possibilities because you can be more creative, you can do more things, you can experiment more. All of that is very good, right? And if you have those, and that therefore creates a space, it also lowers the economic bar. It's less costly mm. to do writing. And when it is, it's then just you having the character and the courage and the willingness to try to write something that might be bad and then to give it to your friends to see what they say and they say they hate it and you have to have the subject not to blow up on them. So it creates the possibility of the spaces of the creative act to have the character development for more people, not just elites, not just aristocracy, not just people who had the means to go through that. So that can be extremely good. Um, I, I think also generally the encounter um, online unveils to you that truly people are different. Like they truly are different. Like wherever you're born, even if you encounter people that don't have the same beliefs as you, it's probable that they're still fairly similar to you just by virtue of sharing geography, um, politics, you know, the, the same country and different things. So it's really, really hard in pure analog to truly encounter difference, like truly encounter it in a very deep way. Well, you really need to encounter difference to understand how epistemology works, how thinking works, how ontology works, and all these different things. And also difference moves you in the direction of the intersuppositional in relationship because you can't have a ground. Like once you see that, wait a minute, how can there be this much difference if ultimately rationality can ground itself axiomatically? 
Oh, because it can't. Oh, huh. Presuppositional philosophy is not possible. So then there's a real move in the direction of how to relate to diversity without giving into the libidinal economy, the, the, the tension of difference that makes you fight and explode. You know, it forces you into a space of acknowledging the reality of difference and then poses the question, what are you going to do about it? Now, that very same thing then turns you to conspiracies, uh, totalitarianism, strongmen. But that same thing also can lead you in the direction of steering your mind in the, wait a minute, maybe we shouldn't focus so much on finding like in non in unconditional truth that we can systemize like in the analog tradition maybe instead we need to focus on the ability for us all in our diversity to relate as a many as one oh that's beauty beauty is an experience of bringing the many into the one oh beauty becomes a priority in your thinking so the very medium and encounters of the internet can do those different things to bring it together um there are other things economically that the internet can do like it, it would allow people say to do work from home or to do new copywriting, you know, different abilities that can open up possibilities to then have more free time. Uh, also the ability of the internet to help you research and to learn about things that you would like, like there's something extremely valuable in the internet where you learn about Alfred Whitehead and you didn't even know who Alfred Whitehead was, right? Like there's a problem with having a preset complex, but then there's a problem in having literal ignorance where you don't know about anything at all, right? So there's a ditch on either side of the road. So the internet can go a long way to helping you. The internet also can lead people in the direction of being generalist more than specialist. And now I think that I think we can take that too far where then specialism is bad. Actually, specialism is very important. But generalist also allows the um, intersection of fields to go together. And the thing is, if you get trained in thinking in terms of intersections of fields and holistic, well, that's the realm of beauty. Like beauty is an intersection of fields and intensities of those fields, or it becomes interdisciplinary and it's an emergence of something in interdisciplinary. So the internet can actually train you to think in a manner that could possibly make you more tuned to beauty precisely in having so much diversity, which the funny thing, having so much difference, having so much diversity is either going to want to, one of two things occurs. It's all fragmented into postmodern chaos. Or two, you learn to integrate it where you make a one out of the many. Well, that can be beauty. It could also be a conspiracy. Uh, so you have to then emphasize um, the aesthetic and then bringing that into the analog, right? And you see, I think there is something about emphasizing beauty that tends to drive people in the analog. If Because I think it's the case that you don't, you can only really, it's more probable you're going to have beauty in the way we're describing in the analog than in the digital. OK, so there's something natural about an emphasis on beauty that pulls to the analog. However, I don't want to say it's impossible to have the strike of beauty um, online or watching, you know, consuming something, watching a movie. I'm not saying that. And indeed, if you had a true dialogos experience, it can do these different things and transform you. Um, but then there's always the question of like, after you have the first dialogos experience that changes your horizon of the world, can it strike you ever again in that new way that changed your course, right? So an error of the internet could be whatever ways the internet can strike you in terms of beauty, um, the mistake may occur to just keep doing that thing over and, and over again. optimize it, right? Because that's, that's the right. intuition of the internet. It's like, oh, that's good. Let, what's the metric for that? What's and the data optimizes. set we can track? Yeah. That's exactly right. And then it ceases to be the strike of beauty or you're not getting the strike of beauty and say rock climbing and having a child and having a family going to there, doing something courageous, et cetera, so forth. Uh, so th those would be some things that come to mind. Yeah, wow, nice. It's sort of like one of the core, one of the core ways of framing this would be that the, the physical, is, there's more substance there, and so it's slower, and there's more at stake, there's more of a cost, there's the the kinds of experiences are richer, but they're harder to come by, whereas the digital is, because it, it's this almost like two-dimensional plane that's moving at the speed of information, it's, lots can be done, you can experiment with a lot of different things at a very low cost, there's this amazing sort of possibility space that opens up but the mistake would be mistaking that for the full depth experience of the real and and that's yeah where we would come back to pulling them together into that perfect reciprocal relationship which sort of the more we're speaking around it the more possible it, it really seems and i, I guess the only <laughs> the only challenge will be around the 
the incentives that are still alive yes. in, in the digital. Um, and I would just say, like, the reason people fall into the mistake of, like, mysticism without religion is precisely because mis- mysticism is amazing. Like, that's, that's the issue. But we know that created all sorts of problems. So why did people fall, like, so the reason why the world fell into hard, like, reductionism is because science is amazing. It works. If you treat parts independent of holes and, like, reduce things down as a method, it's like a skeleton key that unlocks a whole lot. So reductionism works. Like there's a whole lot of talk now where reductionism is bad. And of course, yes, reductionism ontologically is bad. But reduc- but reducing as an empirical tool to focus and examine has been one of the great breakthroughs of the human race. Now, unfortunately, that's the problem. It works so well that then you're like, well, this is the only lens we need. And then you get all of the nihilism and meaning crisis and the lack of spirit and all the things that come from this. So every, like, so basically you had a phase where it's like we can replace religion with mysticism. That created all sorts of problems. Then you have a phase where we can replace philosophy and religion with science. That creates all sorts of problems. Every, I guess like the reason why I get very concerned about the current conversation about the analog and the digital, because basically it's all like either digital is totally evil and, uh, you know, we, we should like be Leadites or something like that. So we'll replace the digital with the analog in a sense. Um, or it's like, well, everything's going to go digital, so we'll replace the digital with the analog. If you go through history, whenever that occurred, it was dysfunctional. Like, there's a historical record of replacement notions being dysfunctional, right? Like, okay, so when we replace the community with work, well, you'll get your friends at work. You'll have co-workers. Those will be your friends. Dysfunction right? All sorts of dysfunction. Like whenever there is a replacement, politics will be your new like religion, right? That will be your new kind of like mission, a political mission, dysfunction, straight dysfunction. But also too, when people are like, I'm just going to live for my family. I'm not going to have anything outside the family. I'm going to just devote myself to this children. Dysfunction, empty nest syndrome, the parents overinvest in the children. You get like, oh, like the, it, it creates all sorts of like when the, when the parents are only living for the kids, that creates dysfunction, right? You know, the parents, the kids actually are happier if the parents have friends outside of the marriage, right? Or they have an alternative life other than just a life for the kids because it's too burdensome. It creates all sorts of dysfunction, right? So you can't replace, the parents cannot replace their life with the children or you get dysfunction. At the same time, they also can't pretend like they don't have children because that creates dysfunction as well, right? So if you, so for me, like if you go through history, And basically all replacement models lead to total disaster in different forms. Why would we, why, why, why would not replacing the analog with the digital do the same? Like why, why would you got a historic record? Maybe it won't, you know, maybe it won't, but you've got a historical record that would suggest it will. So we must err on the side of searching for the symbiotic, the incarnational, the dialectical, as opposed to replacement. Because right now it's basically like, AI will always be smarter than humans. The singularity is coming. What do we do? There's a kind of like, we're going to be replaced. Well, it's like nihilistic for one, uh, but it's like, it's like you're, it's just, that is dysfunctional. So we have to think the relation. And then the question is, what are the best terms of the relation? And it tends to be one that emphasizes beauty because the digital can change your horizon. Like the digital, can the digital give you truth, right? Can it like, get, well, you have to, how many Wikipedia articles are you going to read and then go, oh, this is the truth, right? You can't do that. Oh, it can give you the good. No, it can't. It can give you different structures of the good, right? You know, different like Wikipedia articles. But can it give you the be- Can it give you the possibility of a horizon of attunement with people, say, encircling that makes you have the character to, to then encounter beauty? That seems in accordance to what everything we said. That seems like it has a higher probability of accomplishing that goal as opposed to the goal that most people have been using the digital for, which has been like informing people. Well, what did that do for us? Post-truth, nobody believes anything, the media is dead. Like using the digital to primarily focus on getting people the facts did not work. And it cannot work because you have to have the expertise to evaluate the facts and know they're a fact. Otherwise, you're listening to an authority who you do not trust. Why would you trust them? Because you haven't attuned with them in terms of beauty. So of course you don't trust them. They're just some guy in Washington, D.C. telling you that if you don't believe this, you're stupid or something. That's the that's really going to make a relationship there. And then, of course, if you don't have the shared beauty, how can you have a shared good? It just becomes everyone's idea of the good. And what does that do? Tribalism. 
Everyone gets attracted to their notion of the good and how we're going to save America or stop the bigotry or whatever. And everyone becomes tribal and then there's war, right? So you, em you emphasize data and information and that doesn't work. You emphasize like morality or doing the right thing. You just get tribalism. You need to emphasize using the digital to create the ability to put yourself in the place where you can be struck by beauty and see life in terms of aura. That can be the function that helps us avoid these, th that helps us avoid these various, these, these dysfunctions that are currently very widespread, of which then you can add the truth and the goodness, of course, because you need those as well, but they have to be ordered from, the digital is primarily training you in the ability of the aesthetic. And then from that, you can add the good and the true, of which you're then going to truly believe it is true because it is beautiful. And because the good is beautiful, you will also want to put it into practice. But you have to emphasize that beauty. And, to, and, and that comes out when you start talking about a relation between the analog and the digital, as opposed to a replacement of the digital by the, anal by the analytical. Um, and, and so I think it is extremely important to make this shift, or else we're just going to repeat these mistakes of history where we enter into replacement thinking as opposed to reciprocity. Um, we must think in terms more of reciprocity and a bothness, an AB, not a new AA in the form of a supposed advancement into a bright future that turns out to be bright because it is on fire. So <laughs> it would be nice to avoid that. <laughs> wow. Well, I think I'm going to have to wrap it up here, but this is been After like amazing. four hours yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> I I've could definitely it, keep going, but I think for longevity's sake, let's put a bookmark in here. And <laughs> but yeah, I, I just want to say, like I, I, I know I said some of this in the beginning, but like I've I've been very inspired by you, and I think just leading up to this conversation, I really have been diving into a lot of your conversations. So I've spent a lot of time with you before this, and I think like of of all the people that I've been tracking. I think you're holding one of the, the most variety of pieces, important pieces. Like I, I think there's like a, a breadth to your thinking that is really powerful. So like props to you. It's amazing. Well, Tom, that is extremely kind and it means a lot. Uh, it, it means a lot that you take the time to look through those conversations. And it means a lot that you would give me so many hours of your time uh, to speak. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed it. I'm glad we had a chance to speak more. I would absolutely love to do it more. I, I think um, this topic is utterly critical. Uh, and, 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 and I think featuring it in the, like discussing this topic as we have with, with aid from uh, Forrest Landry's work, I think as mag magnificent in that conversation. So uh, Tom, I always love speaking with you. And uh, this has really been a, a, a real um, treat for me. So thank you for it. It's been, a, it's been an honor. So thank you, Tom. I thank you, Daniel. It. Likewise, my friend. It's Great. been beautiful, if I can put yes. it that way. <laughs> yes, change it. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you, Tom. I appreciate it, sir.